is my god what are we doing here oh yes we're, we're looking at the um present state um we looked at the preferred state and this is a way to sort of the idea here is to um get a sort of collective understanding how people feel about the present with regard to um the problem area you're working on so with respect to poverty where are we now um uh, not so much once again looking for answers, but just sort of getting a, a lay of the land and the same thing for climate. So same um, template, I think it's on the, uh, uh, the same side there. So we'll get about 20 minutes again, and then we'll take uh, time to report out, and then then we'll sort of do a little bit of cross-fertilization and talk about how some of these ideas and some of, some of these uh, issues uh, cross-fertilize, if that makes sense. So we'll give you, uh, we've got about, about 20 pages. Paul Ming Oliver. Um, so who's writing? I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Either one of you here are the papers that were already written on. Um, you can also have the other blank, just in case. I don't know if you'll need it, but you'll probably need sure. it. I mean, I have, I have this blank. Yeah. Either way. And this is just based on, obviously, your personal experience, where you get your information from. But just, if there's no, just lay out the how you see the present state. I'm coming in Pushing a lot of the planetary. And that's where we're That's because COVID, because people they don't know they don't want to work. Mm -hmm. Well, they can't find them. And they can't get them through and shipped. There's been a bunch of issues such as that. So I feel like at will right now, that's an, also an issue. And just not even with COVID, just distribution of like food and resources in general, because we have enough to feed the whole planet, but with inadequate storage and then, you know, people not willing to pay the money necessary, like less economically developed countries are not getting what they need. Yeah. And the yeah. amount of wasted food. Yeah. 40% of that. What was that? Can't it. The amount of wasted food. It's amazing. It really is. It's actually shameful. So, um, with regard to climate two, where in the present state, where do you think governments are in their acknowledging or acting um, in res really in response to the na nature of the crisis? So kind of like just trying to get an idea. Um, from I feel like some places are better than others, but a lot, some are really trying to get it done, but others are kind of ignoring it for the, it's trying to get other problems solved, even though they would benefit each other. But both problems would benefit from a look into what's going on with climate. No. Crime is also increasing. Yeah, I'm just going to Very funny, in California, um, one of the federal uh, trains got robbed, and the robbers just threw out all the mail uh, of the UPS. You know, we have so much. Do you think they would guard federal trains? Yeah. It's not one carrying mail. We also have the ability to just mail. Well, true, but like, doesn't really know, there's a lot of rich sometimes. Well, especially in the bluffs. Yeah. It's so annoying when you're there, the UPS. There's something with FedEx, like, on the vacation where, like, someone forgot to, like, make reservations for the summer. So they had to, uh, they didn't have reservations for the entire summer on so was, like that, was that the vineyard? Was that the bucket? Uh, my dad, I thought I heard say the vineyard, but it might have been in bucket. And it's going to come by water, by air, whatever. Uh, you so 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 also have to have man. You have to have, to have the man. I think if you look even at some of the things in the pathways, I think you know the answer to the question, but who's been primarily responsible for the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere up to this point? Population, people with more populations. Um, I would say more industrial. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, I'm just trying to get at that because there is some sense that um, they've built their economies on their being able to use fossil fuels. And now they're tough. That's where we are. This current, how, we, we do have to get it. And I agree. We've got debt. There are issues that are, that are um, critical here. But here's a question. Can we start thinking about, we've got to bear with you. We're thinking bigger. How about if we start thinking in terms of breaking down the political boundaries? 
Can, can, well, let me just ask you, can you envision, this is, I know we're talking about today, uh, present, so, but this is, just bear with me here, though. Can you imagine a world without nation states? And that just passed I don't, it's hard because, no one, I don't think that would work. It's hard because people seem to naturally divide themselves, unfortunately, into the little nations based on similarities and differences. And it's hard to make everyone agree because everyone has different opinions and people fight on those opinions and therefore create groups with those same opinions and then fight against people with other opinions. This world is built on opinions, and that's just how it is. And I wish it, and I hope that. Well, I think that if we really try to put aside our differences for what may be considered the greater good, whatever that may mean, it would be important to do so. It would, as much as I would. I wish it would. I just don't. I don't think that every single person in the world could come together and come with some sort of consensus. It it's doesn't seem like that would be a possibility, at least at this point in time. Well, yeah, because one that, but it would also be hard to represent everybody because a lot of nations today are kind of founded on like ethnic borders. And when they aren't, there's conflict within the zone. No, you're, let me just ask you, a lot of those... I think that's something that you might not be familiar with. Do you know what underemployment is? All right, so you go off to college, you get a degree in something, but you don't end up working in that field and work a job, so you technically are within the balance of employment, but are working, let's say, a minimum wage job bagging groceries, right? That is underemployment, so you're not living up to the potential wages that you should be earning. That very much is an issue right now. I mean, you're in college right now, right? Like, you know, getting a job out of college is very difficult. And at the end of the day, to your point, would you rather be unemployed or have some form of employment, even if it's not what you want? Right. Um, even with the, let's say, um, degrees you have and the qualifications, it all comes down to whether they can afford to pay for your degree in the first place. And with firing everybody and closing down businesses, they can't afford anything, so. Could there be Something else that they college, if you decide to, hmm? Um, college debt is pretty Doing college debt definitely right but the thing is is the vast majority of you if you decide to go to college chances are you're going to have to stay for another two years and get a master's right unfortunately the the weight of a bachelor's degree has been uh, watered down to the point where most people are going to need a master's degree on top of that um, because if again you'll, you'll find this in a couple of years the weight of a master's degree is also watered down so the thing I have to get my PhD too exactly so at a certain point you know how do we make sure that you know a high school diploma is worth what it's worth a college degree is worth it's worth a master's degree this is why things are um, and so the reason about the Mediterranean you've got Greece Cyprus Egypt Israel, and you're saying we're creating, we're, we're going to share electricity, and because that's the only way that we can do it and support ourselves with renewable energy, because once again, because of the day-night differences, wind blowing at night, demand in the daytime, time zones are close enough now, can be brought close enough together now because of transmission, so they're doing it. One and so, and, and, last thing I'll say is, it doesn't make the news. <laughs> Those are the things that, if we didn't know about them, we let me ask you, if you knew some of these things, would it change your mind about our options and our ability to do things? Where people, we're, we're actually adversaries are working together because they realize that it's, it is either everybody or nobody. Feel like public public transport transport. No. Yes. Oh, good. Okay, no, that's, this is what I was hoping for. Like this. Let's in some ways, I feel like it can public transport. Well, it's important to tax new people at the same time, creating hundreds of thousands. A new, is, like, does everyone have spread out homes, or is everyone kind of packed in together? Like it doesn't go, doesn't go deeper than even. It's very spread out, right? And so everyone lived on Main Street in Falmouth. Right? Maybe these high-rise buildings. Right? You would only need one bus. 
Because right. everyone lived in a centralized be, area. But what's the drive with It's not necessarily a matter of Why you war, it's just a matter of being war. Well, Suppose it's better for the Their emissions. People I mean, the big like places the, 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 mm -hmm. and, and that's one that makes really aren't totally rising. 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 California, there's also a problem in uh, the prices for housing being too high. Yeah, I mean, Egypt's a good example because Egypt has such an issue with, with land development that they're taking their capital, which is Cairo, and they're literally moving it elsewhere. So they're building an entirely new city that's land that's supposed to be, you know, it's going to have all their government buildings, all their military buildings. They're going to build stadiums for the World Cup and for the Oli future Olympics, too. So that way everything is condensed in this one area. But the thing is, is like, that obviously costs a lot of money, a lot of manpower in order to essentially build a brand new city from scratch. Which is kind of interesting. What's going to happen with the old city? So it's Cairo, so it's just going to be... It's, 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 it's just going to stay there. But they're just changing they're the just capital. Cha yeah, they're essentially... Okay. So Indonesia's doing the same thing, so it's in Jakarta, a different island. Yeah. Yeah. They, they have, like, two candidates on... Uh, I for, like, the larger island? Yeah. Uh, with Burundi and Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with Indonesia, Jakarta is similar to New Orleans, where it's, like, a couple feet under... We have an alternative. We've, we've started new industries before, right? I mean, it's, so um, it, it, it's, it's just a question of if, if you were in charge, what would be your position? For, and I, you're going to get pushback, but that's what government, that's what policymakers have to be ready for. They know people are going to push back. Has it already happened, though? Doesn't, like, didn't Biden say like, um, Less than certain percentage like of vehicles have to be electric. Like here in the U.S. Yeah, so that's that's a pr that's a present present well, the present state. Yeah, so we do have that. That's a, absolutely important to understand that there has been that commitment, and at the same time, the largest. Do you know who's the largest electric vehicle producer? Tesla. Right? Oh, country. What country? So I think we talked about crime in the first section too, right? Yeah. Kind of like. China. And, and China says that we're going to be the leaders in the in the in the future in energy, and energy is not going to be coal, it's not going to be oil, it's not even going to be natural, it's going to be renewables. And they said, but the, and the main thing we have to do though is wean the world off of oil. And we see, I mean, it's been, you know, just look at what what's happened with the with the war and everybody depended upon. A few sources for this. So it. So anyway, I just you know that's so that is that one thing that's happening. And can somebody, in terms of the present state, have a sense of how does you, you both brought this up, Jack? You brought this up too. Uh, how does the price or the cost of building and and renewable energy um, sources compare with fossils today? You know how they compare. Compare. Yeah. Compare. I know. I'm saying. How do you, so the, I'm just phrasing the question to make sure I get it. So how does fossil fuels compare to non-renewable? I mean, uh, to renewable. To renewables. In terms of, the, because of the, as a, as a policy maker, your concern, if you think about pushback, is what are the ratepayers going to say? They don't want my energy prices going up. So cost of new wind and solar, but primarily wind generated energy, compares is so almost on par if not um, lower than fossil fuels today. Yeah. Amory Lovins, who was, he, he was in the same sort of generation as Bucky Fuller. You probably haven't heard Amory Lovins, but he was a guru in renewable energy when I was about your age. And he's still doing this stuff. And he's um, a, a, a professor at Stanford University, but he also runs a, a group called the Rocky Mountain Institute. The New York Times today has reported that, he's, that no, in terms of of uh, energy cost to consumers, wind and solar now compare favorably, if not less than fossil fuel, because... Yeah, if you ever go to Amsterdam, so there are, like, it's a, the most bike-friendly city in the world. There's like more bikes than people. Yeah, there are, and, and if... Amsterdam, um, like, the Netherlands? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think, no, to your point that there are more bikes and there are people and you look around and just everyone bikes around and there is like a tram and they drive cars, you know, like obviously smaller European cars, but it was really interesting seeing just like flocks of people commuting to work on bikes, which is just something you would never see in, in, in our own country. 
right? So, I mean, that's a dilemma. You know, what, that, one of the things that, that's a reality. The, you know, that's why I put up the I kind of worry about you. you know, Everything that we use, like, like you know, things can be doing something and not bother. That's not that far off. I mean, not just from a fictional gameplay what else? sort of scenario. In terms of what else inspires how, dig, you? how deep we're digging ourselves into the situation. So, it doesn't have to be politicians, too. I feel like we, you, we tend what, to revert what, what do you to know that, but like or think about anyone say, locally what can we do? within your I family. Think, well, especially in America, not so much in Europe. Other countries, other but ideas, too much principles like that inspire you. Structure is more like mm -hmm. values. Cars instead of public transportation or pedestrian. My family inspires me. Yep. Yep. Well, continue, continue. Oh, I mean, that was... <laughs> yeah. Again, trying to make their lives yeah. better. They're trying to make your lives better, right? They probably say that all the time, but, you know? And, and, and so it's, it's reciprocal. It's not just a one-way street. It's, once again, you know, if you look at history... There's a metaphoric two-way street. That wasn't sort of... But hopefully with bikes and sidewalks. That was a <laughs> conscious decision, you know? But the highway were built <laughs> to accommodate automobiles, right? And Henry Ford and all the rest. And I mean, so it was... We, we did have... So in, but let's start to kind of think about what do you think that they're here's writing the thing, down too. and how can we connect Technology our topic and of poverty to theirs our with iterative process, uh, climate right? action. And they're not a lot of places that are getting affected by these climate uh, issues are also experiencing a lot of poverty. Mm -hmm. yeah. We were kind of emerging from any the particular places that, you know, that come to mind. And India. You know what I mean? Okay. That, that, that we did things that we mm -hmm. that are coming back to haunt. Right. No, but we didn't so, realize you know, that they were going to be. You know, we did second. Yeah, there, whenever we recycle things, personally, we actually end up selling any to sort of transportation. The right. That's um, but it can be so so our diplomatic well, relationship with the Philippines is very important. It can be if we were to cut off ties to the Philippines, chances are. And that's what I'm saying. Your recycling ends up going in the trash. And that's what I'm saying. It's unfortunate. Well, it but then, depends you know, could on, we, in theory, build recycling I mean, plants in the in states, so that way we can get rid of for they don't 11 know. years, so we never had a car. I'm I mean, that's a city, it's a di and that's one of the arguments. Yeah, I mean, China definitely sells to the Philippines as well, so the Philippines, they unfortunately, gets it kind of from both the West and the East. to sprawling out, Literally, and as you say, being in a situation where right. you're not near anything, and your only option is then not even... It's not just transportation, it's personal transportation. It's just having an arm. Recycling plans. You just can't do that in a life before. So, do they, you know, I, these things plans. sound huge, don't just sit yeah. But yeah, they, 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 they do. There were times when they didn't exist. Not to the scale. I mean, an China has them too. too. I mean, but, but you know, and again, they're 1.7 billion. billion. So, again, their, their pollution is obviously much bigger than America has 337 million people. And before, on a scale wise, it's completely different. But, you know, there's a lot of different reasons. Why we don't invest in recycling? Right. One of which is kind of expensive, and like breaking down rail, plastics, rail, breaking down glass, things of that sort. That would be the best um, and not every in the town but wants to pay for that, that's be the best in right? And so, and what's tricky is, is, do you get a group of towns and, and try to like collectively fight for that, or do you have a private private organization that does it, and then the towns pay that organization? So it's just a matter of how do you go about doing that. No, I know, just so you know, for I'm, example, in Bourne, I don't have any of you in Bourne, but um, I, I served a number their, of years like, uh, hope you don't walk land dump is filling up, and they're going to have to push it off Cape at some point in time. So I was, then, uh, I don't know if you know the train years, over by the Bourne Ridge. Right? That's a train that only pretty much brings trash and tourists, but mostly trash. The day that the that brings a lot of cake to the different the um, trust plants and we all the cell towers. I mean, in theory, could you give people jobs at recycling plants? Like, could you, you kill two birds with one stone? Also, wind farm in the United States, which yeah, yeah, yeah. right off the coast of But again, it comes down to pays for it. And you're probably before your time, but nonetheless, it was the most um, controversial Egypt project that I've ever been involved with. Because it's going to create jobs to look at those wind farms. Even There's arguments, jobs, people and in restaurants it was where, you know, people are eating primarily food on their lunch break. The rich like just that, said, you're going to uh, spoil my view jobs, by putting those. Done, they, right? Here's the interesting thing. They didn't even want us to use the term farms. wind right. farm. They have to build another project. It's an no, it's a, it's right. a industrial park. park. It's not a farm. I mean, that's the best work. So, but to your point, you will always find people who will be in opposition, even to what some folks because it's really good right idea. Right what's now, happened now is that, the United you know, States is almost dead example, right now. And you know, you might live production. in New York, you might then go out for coffee in the morning, so, right, um, go to work in your office. You guys have done any other, any other present. Get another cup of coffee, go back to work. State. But if you do remote work, climate, 
the Pardon? coffee shops, the restaurants, the hot dog stands. So tell them, how do you, in relating that to It doesn't have people to sell their products. Well, whether it be... Right, so what happens to them? Um, food sources, whether it be meat yeah, or vegetables or whatever it may be, it's going to come from the environment. And over farming is going to harm a lot. And then greenhouse gases from farming inside of greenhouses. Yeah, I mean, is it there for like, you know, one company or that for they have no relationship to decide to go? I don't think so much the greenhouse, but some of the chemical that so hard. Yeah. It's like people don't and recognize the big mechanized, you know, again, those the big jobs, agribusiness, which is not what we have here. For the most part, in you know, New England, who but they are big and they're tickets. combines, air conditioned, you know, big gets the soil off vehicles the street, and they chop like up the, things that sort. The, the, the soil. So anyway, I'm going to have to, this is, I could go, we could do this for a while, but this was a great conversation. Uh, we're going to break and do reports, report outs, if we could. And yeah. this time we'll start. Yeah, the human development and pollution uh, are harming biodiversity and just in general if we're like, pushing all of our planetary boundaries uh, yeah, throughout the environment. Um, yeah, so shipping issues and issues with the distribution of resources, uh, such as food. So we're wasting food and wasting space. Because, um, you know, like on farms, when you first get the crops, a lot of it is left behind because it doesn't look good enough, but it gets on the truck. The truck's not refrigerated well enough, doesn't make it to the store. What makes it to the store? People aren't buying. like. Yeah. Can, can I interrupt you one, one bit? Because I, I think it's important. It's, it's really sort and so there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And this isn't the, the total solution, but it's sort of interesting because, like, once again, I'm old, so I remember when this was not, you won't probably believe that this was a big deal back in, 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 in when I was literally back in the 70s. But farmers markets, the whole idea of direct marketing, farmers bringing their produce directly from the farm to the city, then all of a sudden that slightly blemished Produce wasn't the problem. Farmer, the customer said, "Wait, that's you're, it's spoiled." He said, "It's not." He said, "There's something wrong." Said, it's not. Then the farmer said, "Taste it," <laughs> and they taste it, and it would just, you know, they said, "Okay, so I'll buy it." So they, they they were able to do that. They're also able to be more responsive to consumers' needs because all of a sudden, consumers said, "Can you grow collard greens?" And one farmer said, "Yeah, I can grow collards. Is there market? This market going to be here?" So anyway, they're just there. There are ways. Sometimes local, sometimes federal, sometimes government, but sometimes just communities respond. Yeah. Uh, to uh, revert to sustainable energy, um, redistribution of tax money. Uh, so like with rich people not getting enough taxes, we don't have the resources we need. Um, various nation states, so we're just like very split up and in disagreement all the time. Um, various industry housing and gas and we talked about economic instability such as inflation debt and labor shortages throughout the world we also talked about complications in health insurance and medicare and stuff like that we talked about um how there's limited land for housing and agriculture we talked about complications in education such as college debt and we call um we talked about crime increasing across the globe very good. So let me ask you guys now, as uh, all members of the um, Ministry for the Future, right? We've got a little bit of the overlap between sort of the issues around climate and eliminating poverty or dealing with, with, with poverty, right? Well, we talked a little bit about this, but just want to kind of get your, your take on this as being the folks that are looking at that the poverty, pro uh, poverty problem. Um, it was brought up in, our, in the group here that one of the obstacles with uh, regard to sort of meeting the greenhouse gas emission goals, particularly with renewable energy, is that um, it, and you're right, it does cost a lot to build, to build out your renewable energy infrastructure, whether it's wind or whatever. And the question that we posed was, do you think that as the ministry, if you had the power, would you be inclined to propose that richer nations pay poor nations or provide assistance, and I'm going to just say pay, but I would pretty much outright say support their development of their renewable energy resources. And I'll tell you why we thought that might be a good idea, but just before we do that, what would be your response? Um, I don't think that's a bad idea. But you can also do that through private companies, and contracts with private companies. They have an incentive to, you know, also help them further on develop their technology. But um, as the U.S. as a major power, 
I don't see anything against supporting smaller countries and developing their energy output. Now, just one thing here. Remember now, you're not representing the United States. You're representing the world. You're the Ministry for the Future at the Global... I know, we keep. it's hard to remember that because we're just doing this as a, a short exercise. But would you... Could you insist? And I agree with you about the private sector. You wanting to get them involved. What would be their reticence or their reluctance to do it in the world? Anybody? Kind of. Well, if you were if you were a private developer and someone said um, we want you to build um, wind turbines or wind farm um, in uh, off the coast of Africa. Uh, um, Northern Africa. Why would, what would be your first question? Well, um, for them, um, it's probably, there's a lot of risk involved. And um, the question is, why would they invest it um, if they won't make a profit big enough? Yeah. See, that would be, yeah. And, and here's the thing. One of the, just in terms of a, some of these projects is, has to do with finding, once again, the resources. You know, the, the metals and mining. Mining for, forget about the sort of environment, there are you know, all sorts of environmental problems, but it is very risky. I mean, you know, because we don't, it's, it's hard to, we don't quite know where all these deposits are. I mean, it's a, it's a you know what I'm saying? It's a speculative sort of deal to try to figure out where are these ores. And sometimes you see outcroppings, but you have to understand there's no guarantee. It's a very difficult process to try to, and then extracting. I mean, so there's a lot of expense and there's a lot of time involved. What a country like China, who is determined to be the world leader in renewable energy does, and they can do it because, right, it's an authoritarian government, they're assuming the risk. Because they say, the mines, you know, we're, we're going to do this. And I think those are things that when we talk about what we could do, one of the concepts that's arisen is, what if we, you, the ministry, just bear with me where he took all of the world's minerals and metal, the resources. Remember that map that showed how they're distributed all sort of, you know, radically around the country, but said those are part of the global commons. Do you know what a commons is? So that means it belongs to all of us. No one owns the minerals anymore. They belong to all of us. And you, let me just think about this. I'm, I'm when you're trying, you as a council. Make the rules. You establish the rules for exploration, for extraction, and you can even say, we're not going to go after all of them until we find more environmentally responsible ways to extract minerals from the earth. I mean, technology. So you put the charge, the responsibility on the industry to say, because we have to, we are extracting. When, when someone, do you know who Bill McKibben is? Bill McKibben's an environmental writer, and he talks a lot about if we wean ourselves from oil, coal, and natural gas, we're going to eliminate drilling. Is that right? And, and because we're going to be using renewable energy resources. Is that, is that a, an accurate statement? Depends. What is it? Depends. The drilling is still used, not necessarily for mining, but it, it's it's used for, <coughs> It's sorry. It's used for other things such as construction. So drilling could still be used, drilling in the earth, whether that be drilling wells or drilling other sorts of things. They could still be used, just not as at a high, not as much of a high amount, not as much of an amount as you would be in mining. We got to dig them out. I mean, that is, and there are. It, I mean, even you know the, the cobalt, lithium. Sort of, if you've been hearing, you know, you've heard about those. When all of a sudden we went from internal combustion to electricity, and but even to things like smartphones, I think I mentioned before, I mean, th as these get more powerful, there are more demands, a little bit of this, this frozen or whatever that element is that we need, but it is still, we're still going to have to dig. And, and we're just digging for different things. I just think people need to, that's a, that's a reality, but we can you can, right, as the Ministry for the Future, say um, there's got to be more precision mining. We need to figure out how to do that. And what we'll do is we'll support a research and development agenda, 
for universities and the mining industry to come together and figure out who comes up with the best proposal for us being able to do this and, and mine responsibly. So anyway, sorry, got a little carried away there, but those are, there, there are some overlaps there and I, 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 this is not gonna be easy. I mean, I don't think anybody expected that, that because even as Jack or some, someone pointed out that we've, we've made a commitment that is as, as, a, as a nation, but I also think as a world to a large extent about these goals for, right, for meeting greenhouse gas emissions, but there's no enforcement. <laughs> if you don't meet them, what's the penalty? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah nothing. There's some public anger and shame. There's going to be no, there was no material consequences. There's right. moral consequences and there's social consequences. But there's no consequences per se. And so, that would, we know of. That, that we know, we know of. of. Yeah. But would you all support enforcement and penalties for people who, or for countries? Well, let me put it this way. So if countries were going to be penalized, what might, how might they respond in terms of their commitment? They get out of it. Or drastically reduce it, right? Say, we're, we're, we're going to do this amount. So you'd have to do a couple of things, right? You'd have to, you'd have to make the commitments non-binding, and then you'd have to say there's a penalty if you don't. I'm just suggesting that, that something short of that is going to make it very difficult for us to perhaps meet those goals because the clock is ticking. It's kind of like, you know, where we are. So um, very good work. Please, I, I, if you could, if you would, um, we've got one more just small discussion. It's almost like just a wrap up, but I would like to, um, as opposed to doing it separately and, and, and with pencil and paper, is just start just asking a few questions about from all of you, sort of as a as a full ministry here, um, in both terms, in, in terms of, and I'm even limited to just poverty and uh, the issues of poverty and uh, climate. But in general, where we, let me just ask you, where where is the world headed uh, in, in ter for you in terms of the goals of a just and sustainable world? topic of this conference. So where where are we? How are we how are we faring in terms of, of traveling down the road and meet that, that goal? Just what, what do you think? Some I mean, topics are better than others. Some well, things are in yeah. this case there's a lot of things that have improved in the past years, but there's also a lot of things that have been pushed aside because, uh, for obvious reasons because of COVID and other issues and other things, and it's been pushed aside more than it should have been, but at the same time, some things have gotten better, I would say, so it, some things are better than others, and we're going in, in, we are going in the right direction in certain ways, but there's a lot more we could be doing. How do you all feel about climate science and what the climate scientists are telling us about um, where the earth is headed? I'm just you don't no right or wrong no, nobody but do you believe what they're what they're saying do you believe the science mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. and so if you believe the science the reason I'm asking this question about where are we headed is that some things may be better than others but uh, here's a, here's a, here's the thing I'll ask but if, so if you had to take a look at some of those you may not remember all of those sustainable development goals but I could put them up there but I don't think we have to do that but let me just say, if you could prioritize those, some, you know, there's health for all, there's um, um, climate, there's um, ending hunger. Uh, you can kind of go, you can probably guess what many of them are. But if you were, if you didn't have an unlimited budget, you were forced to prioritize against the backdrop of what Mother Nature is, what's happening in the, in the world in terms of the natural world, our, our life support system. Let me put it that way. In terms of the threats to our life support system, what would you? How would you rank the priorities of what we should be addressing? How many problems they solve? No, give me. I need to. Know what? What is? What? What? If we've got to deal with some things because we're on a, the, we're on a timer or we're on that. You know the, the 
the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. You probably don't know who those guys are, but they have this little clock, and it's so many minutes towards midnight um, when they look at how close we get, are maybe getting to thermonuclear war. And that, it's right now, I think, about a half a second to, to midnight. I mean, it's really, you know, that, that doesn't mean anything. Except that, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that if we could be doing, making progress in some areas, but if we're not making progress in those areas that threaten the world's life support system, does it matter as much if you were going to prioritize? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just, so where do you think we, where would you put more emphasis as the federal, where would you place your, your emphasis in saying this is the thing we've got to deal with right now if we want to save humanity? And by the way, you've probably heard this many times. It's, this is not about saving the world. It's about saving us. It's about saving humans. Because I, I don't think, personally, I think the Earth would survive us. The Earth has, has, has endured greater impacts in humanity. We now seem, you know, the Anthropocene, do you know that, that era, the, the geologists are now saying that there's a new epic on the Earth. We call it the Anthropocene because we are now the major, major force on this planet in terms of change, humans, human activity has now become the primary force of change. But um, I, you, you, you would have to think that the planet, I was going to use the term Gaia, but I've resisted a little bit. Do you know what the Gaia hypothesis is? You know, do you know who, what Gaia is? The Greek goddess of the Earth? Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. Jim Lovelock is a NASA uh, instrument designer in Great Britain. Lynn Marvelous is, was a microbiologist at both Boston University and then at UMass Amherst. They were the first to propose this um, notion, a scientific notion, that the Earth is a living organism. The Earth as a whole is a living organism and we're basically a part of that organism. And that the goal, if you were to say, of that or so what's the goal of this? Let me ask you just to guess, I've not heard of it. But what would you, what might you think is the goal of the Earth as a living organism? To survive. Um, I would say to survive. To survive, yes. And what is, what is, could you expand on that just a little bit? To evolve, get better, survive, yes. and live through any issue that comes up. Yes, and so you know what, and interpreted by these two scientists, they say that the goal of Guy is to maintain the conditions necessary for life. To maintain the conditions necessary for life, acknowledging this, 90% of the species that ever lived on the planet have become extinct. And why is that? Because niches expand, niches contract. You know, the species adapts to a particular niche, right, where there's food and where there's support, and life support. But they're very, this is instructive, and I'll make this the last point, but it's very instructive that the, most of the species, their very living undermines the environment that they're in and makes it eventually unlivable for them. Does that make sense? Successful, right? So you're living in that niche, you're act and you're act doing what you need to do to survive, but in the process, you're making, you're almost ensuring your extinction. And then that niche closes, but what happens? Someone takes your place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another species comes in, takes the place, takes advantage of that altered environment, which is good for them, wasn't good for the one that went extinct, but it's good for them, and they come and do it. We, as a species, I will say this, are distinct from other, uh, let's look, you have this argument, but are distinct from other species in that we are niche expanders and niche adapters, not just, we don't just adapt to a niche, we actually create our own niches, and so therefore, we have the ability to avoid that conundrum, that, that dead end, right? Humans can, in fact, control their fate and, and avoid that, but at the same time, we do what other species haven't done, we can also accelerate our extinction, right? So, I mean, we have both of those options. And I don't mean to be overly, I mean, melodramatic, I mean, but this is really where we are now. I think about this every day, and I'll be 
totally honest with you, think about it, every day I wake up because I have four grandchildren. And I'm saying to myself, you know what, before this all sort of comes down, I will be doing my permanent sort of dirt nap, right? I'll be gone, and I don't mean to make light of it, but, but I look at my grandkids, there's no way that if I have any power within me to avoid them inheriting a dystopian world or a no world, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do whatever it is I can because that's what we, so that's kind of like what this, that's what we, we have to, when you do approach officials and politicians and present them with viable options, they may not even know those options are viable. They may be influenced by industry in such a way as that, yeah, we know that, but that's not going to happen. So if for those of us that really do care about this, I'm not saying, I just really want you to know that we're trying to develop some tools that will empower folks to become informed participants in the process that we've all been dealing with here, right? How, how, do, we, how do we actually become effective participants and not just, not just protesting, um, but really becoming involved? So I'll leave it, and that's why, you know, my, my parting shot is, yeah, I, I'm not protesting, but you know what? I'm advocating that we build a world grid. That was a dream of, of Fuller's. It's, a, it's actually sort of self-organizing right now in many parts of the world.